Nahmuduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihil kareem. We praise him and send blessings upon his noble messenger. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and send blessings upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's noble messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. I seek refuge in Allah from the accursed shaitan. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Indeed, all praises are due to Allah. We praise Him and we seek His assistance and forgiveness. And we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of ourselves and our bad deeds. Whoever Allah guides, there is none that can misguide Him. And whoever He leads astray, there is none that can guide Him. And I bear witness that there is no God other than Allah. He has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his servant and messenger. Oh my Lord, expand for me my breast with assurance and ease for me my task and untie the knot from my tongue that they may understand my speech. Surah Taha. Ayats number 25 to 28. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Today we will begin a beautiful surah. Surah Kahaf has many, many lessons. It is the 18th surah of the Quran Majid. We are in the 15th para uh, right now. 74 verses of uh, Surah Kahaf are in this para, para 15. And then from 75, uh, ayats number 75, verse number 75 to 110 is in Jews 16. Uh, surah Kahaf is an amazing surah. And uh, we will see the uh, what it includes, inshallah ta'ala. As we see here uh, in Surah Kahaf, is, uh, there is a story of the people of the cave then the man with the two gardens, then there's the story of Musa al-Islam and Hazrat Khizr al-Islam, then there is the story of Zul Qarnan. What do we learn from the people of the cave? We are told about from the people of, we are told the time and place, we're told about the number of people, there's a debate about the number of people who are in the cave, the miracle, of, the miracle of Allah that occurred. What are the lessons that we learn from the people of the cave is that steadfastness and faith Mm, uh, are the the most important things and um, acceptance of uh, our prayers is there and then in um, man with two gardens what do we see we see arrogance there the advice given to that man who is arrogant the what are the everlasting virtues that Allah talks Allah tells us about and then uh, we the lessons that are learned are that we should be humble and we should we should um, carry our deeds with the humility, inshallah. Then again, Musa al-Islam and Khizr al-Islam, the meeting of Musa al-Islam with Khizr al-Islam, the strange actions of Khizr al-Islam, the strange events that occur, uh, the, the damaging of the boat, the killing of the boy, the erecting of the wall. What are the lessons that we learn there? We will see all these. These will become clear as we go through this um, surah, inshallah. The, the lessons learned there, the knowledge and wisdom of Allah, is beyond human ability. And uh, then the uh, fourth story here is the story of Zulkarnan, uh, the justice, the help, the signs of Qiyamah, and the les lessons learned there. We will see um, using power and authority to help other people. Uh, the, the fact that a, 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 a somebody, a, a leader, a powerful leader is humble enough to help anyone who asks for help, Alhamdulillah. Um, so this is what all that we're going to cover in Surah Kahaf. Uh, may Allah help us to go through this beautiful surah in a beautiful way, inshallah, ameen. The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, whoever recites Surah Al-Kahaf on Friday, light will extend from his feet to the heights of the heaven on the Day of Judgment. This is reported in Tabrani from Abu Sayyid. So we all want light in our lives. We all want to uh inshallah have get out of darkness into the light so and this is a beautiful hadith that we just saw that whoever recites surah kahaf on friday light will extend from his feet to the heights of the heaven 
on the day of judgment. We all will need light that day, alhamdulillah. And uh, then the other beautiful hadith that we see here is that Abu Darda reported Allah's apostle, peace be upon him, as saying, if anyone learns by heart the first 10 verses of Surah Kahaf, he will be protected from the Dajjal. So this is reported in Sahih Muslim. So we all want to be protected from the Dajjal, inshallah. Let's try to learn by heart the first 10 verses of Surah Kahaf, inshallah ta'ala. There are many merits to this surah, alhamdulillah. And um, we see that, inshallah ta'ala, uh, that uh, the period of revelation for, uh, for this surah was, this is the first uh, of the those surahs which were revealed in the third stage uh, uh, from the fifth to the tenth year of prophethood of, at Makkah. The persecution of Muslims were severe, but, um, but migration to Habsha had not yet been, had not yet taken place. And uh, we see that this surah was revealed to answer the, the uh, three questions which the Mushrikeen of Makkah, in consultation with the Jews, had put to the prophet in order to test him. First was, who were the companions of the cave? What, was, what is the real story of Hazrat Khizr? And who was Zulkarnan? These were the three questions that were posed. These three questions and the stories involved concerned the history of the Jews and were unknown in Arabia. These questions were intended to test whether Prophet Muhammad was really divinely guarded, guided or would or would try to avoid the questions. They wanted to see the Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam know the answers to these questions or not. Allah not only provided a complete answer to these questions, but also explained the three stories to the advantage of the opponents of Islam. The questionnaires were told that the companions of the cave believed in uh, some doctrine of Tawheed, oneness of God, which was being put forward in the Quran and that their condition was similar to the condition of the persecuted Muslims of Makkah. On the other hand, the persecutors of the companions of the cave had behaved in the same way towards them as disbelieving Quraysh were behaving towards the Muslims. Besides this, the Muslims have been taught that even if the believer is persecuted by a cruel society, he should not bow down before the falsehood. Rather, he should migrate from that place if needed. The disbelievers of Makkah were told that the story of the companions of the cave was a clear proof uh, about the life hereafter. Allah has the power to put the people to sleep for hundreds of years and bring them back to active life after that long sleep or death as he did in the case of the companions of the cave. And so the story of the companions of the cave is also used to warn the chiefs of Makkah who were persecuting the newly formed Muslim community. At the same time, the Prophet Wasallam is being instructed that he should in no case make a compromise with the persecutors, nor should he consider them to be more important than these poor followers. The story is also meant to com comfort and encourage the oppressed Muslims and relate to them how righteous people in the past saved their faith. On the other hand, the chiefs of Quraysh are demolished that they should not be puffed up with this uh, transitory life that they are enjoying. Rather, they should seek the excellence of the hereafter, which will be uh, permanent and eternal. Similarly, the story of Khizr and Mus Mo Hazrat Musa -Islam not only provides an answer to the disbelievers, but also provides comfort to the believers. The believers are told, you should have full faith in the wisdom of what is happening in the world according to the will of Allah. As the reality is hidden from you, sometimes it appears that things are going against you. In fact, they may not be. If the curtain is removed from the unseen, you would yourselves come to know that not only it is happening for the best, but most of the times it is also producing good results for you. The same is true of the story of Zulkarnan. Um, it also admonishes the questionnaires as if to say, O oh, chiefs of Makkah, you should learn a lesson from Zulkarnan. Though he was a great ruler, a great conqueror, and the owner of great resources, yet he always surrendered to Allah, whereas you are rebelling against him, even though you are insignificant as compared to him. 
besides this, though Zulkarnain built one of the strongest walls, yet his real trust was in Allah, not in the wall. He believed that the wall shall stay as long as it was the will of Allah, whereas you who possess only insignificant dwellings in comparison to him, consider yourself to be permanently safe and secure against all sorts of calamities. So these are the beautiful lessons in this Surah Kahaf. Inshallah, we will uh, begin very soon. But uh, one more thing that I would like to share is that um, blessed is the home in which this Surah is recited. A companion recited it in his house. He had a horse on his property. As he recited it, the horse became startled and then tranquil. He looked up to find that there was a cloud hovering over him. The companion related the event to the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He replied, keep reciting. Calm, defend, de calm descends when it is recited. This is reported in Sahih Bukhari hadith number 5011 and in Sahih Muslim hadith number 241795. So uh, calm descends on people who recite Surah Kahaf. May Allah give us the opportunity to recite this beautiful surah often and especially on Friday. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. All praises for Allah, the one who has revealed the book to his slave and has not placed therein any crookedness. Alhamdulillah, all praises, all praises for Allah. All praise, all thanks is for Allah, the one who revealed this beautiful Quran. If we didn't have Quran in our lives, can you imagine what our lives would have been like? 
we would have had no divine guidance and we would be guessworking, maybe this is right, maybe that is right. And so Allah made it clear for us what the guidance is and then he placed in it no crookedness. There is no crookedness. There is straight, proper instructions for us on how to lead our lives. There is no confusion. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Ayat number two. He has made it straight to warn of a severe punishment from him and to give glad tidings to the believers who do righteous deeds that for them is a good reward. Alhamdulillah, it is Allah's mercy when he tells us that there is severe punishment uh, waiting for people who do bad. Because if he didn't tell us about hell, if he didn't tell us about punishment, then, how, then we would have had no fear and we would easily do sins and we wouldn't think that anything would happen. So it is Allah's mercy that he tells us about a severe punishment. And uh, through Rasul Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we found out that there is hell and there is heaven. So he came to give us warnings, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he gave us, get, came to give us glad tidings that if we do good, this is an incentive. This is something to... In, inspired towards this is something we want to reach out for this is our success these if we uh, there will be glad tidings of heaven and allah's pleasure and allah's um, um being happy with us and that there is a good reward Ayat number three they will will abide in it forever. Those people who attain Jannah with the mercy of Allah will be there forever. And to warn those who say Allah has taken a son. Now here, um, Allah's tawheed uh, is something that nobody should shake or, or try to shake. And um, the, the monotheistic view is the only view uh, that Allah wants us uh, to uh, retain in our hearts and souls. We are supposed to be not those who associate partners or say that Allah has begotten a son and to warn those who say and they are people in this world who say that Allah has a son they do not have any knowledge about it nor had their forefathers grave is the word that comes out of their mouths nothing they say except a lie it is a very bad monstrous thing that comes out of the mouth of those who say that Allah has a son and then Ayat number six, then perhaps you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would kill yourself in grief over them if they do not believe in this narration. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how much Rasul Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his heart is hurting because people don't want to believe in, in the messages of Allah, in the Tawheed. They always try to uh, bring partners in with Allah and it, it really hurts him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acknowledges that, that don't, don't do this, you know, um, only Allah can guide. And, uh, you know, uh, you are there to convey the message and inshallah, Allah will open up the hearts. Indeed, we have made that which is on earth an adornment for it, that we may test as to which of them is best in these. This is the purpose of life, the purpose of life. life for us is to believe in one God, to go do good deeds and to know that we are being tested. The purpose of our existence here is, is so that we are tested. Everything that we do, we are being tested. If in the eyes of Allah, is it something that is pleasing Allah that we're doing or is it something that is displeasing? We have to focus on the akhirah to know that if we want to achieve Jannah, we have to be focused on doing good deeds and um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayat 7 that this earth is an adornment there are, there are many attractive things in this earth uh, there are many attractive things in this earth and um, uh, you know the beauty of this earth the treasures in the in the in the earth for example the gemstones and the minerals and the vegetation and the and the uh, all there's so many things the animals and everything that attracts human beings is here and indeed we will make what is on the on it a barren ground so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has first allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that there is all this beauty on earth and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that everything can finish if allah wants he can make it a barren ground and for people who have four seasons in the localities that they live they can see that how a tree and vegetation blooms into in the springtime and then in fall everything starts withering away and in winter it's all dead the same thing that allah can make a fertile ground into barren ground if allah so wills 
a, a day shall come when the entire adornment of the earth will perish and the earth will become a level place. Then we will requit the pious and the impious, each according to his action. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge us. And then um, ayat number nine, or, or you think that the companions of the cave and the inscription were wonders among our signs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now is beginning to relate to us uh, a, a, a story of the companions that um, do you think that they were a wonder? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about uh, uh, that the inscription on the on there. So when we as we go along with the story, we will see that these uh, young youth who who ran away to the cave and eventually there was um, a tablet put over them when they passed away, uh, uh, inscription on where they uh, were buried. We go to ayat number 10, when the youths treated, when the youths retreated to the cave and said, our Lord grant on us mercy from yourself and facilitate for us our affair in the right way. So these, this is a beautiful story coming up of the youths. They retreated to the cave and said, Our Lord, grant on us mercy from yourself and facilitate for us our affair in the right way. So this is a beautiful dua that the youth said, Rabbana atina milla dunka rahma wahayyalana amrena min amrena rashada. So uh, it is a dua, which means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please make it easy for us, our affair in the right direction, in the right way. This is the, um, the youth that um, there's a tremendous lesson in this story for the modern youth. Uh, so that these youth were such that were connected to Allah. May our youth also become closer to Allah and realize that they are how Allah protects those who go towards him and how these youth, how these young men were protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were from the elite class, but they were on tawheed, they were on monotheism. And the nation at that time were uh, pagans. They um, believed in many gods and so on. So these people, these youths didn't want to go along with this. And they, they claimed um, that they they claimed their belief, they let their belief known uh, to the nation at that time and to the king at, at that time. They made it known that they were on Tawheed, that they believed in the oneness of Allah, that they didn't want to practice their ways, the, the ways of idol worship. And so the king wanted to um, catch them and wanted to torture them and didn't want them to believe in one God, but wanted them to believe in what was the prevalent belief at that time. So these people wanted to save their faith. These young youths wanted to save their faith and they ran to the cave and they ran away from being um, caught and uh, being forced to um, follow their way. So here we go in, um, in ayat number 10, when the youths retreated to the cave, and said, our Lord grant on us mercy from yourself and facilitate for us our affair in the right way. And we cast a cover over their ears in the, in the cave for a number of years. Allah put them to sleep. When they, when they ran to the cave, Allah helped them because they said this beautiful dua, they said, please Allah, our Lord grant us from yourself mercy and facilitate for our affair in the right way. This beautiful dua was, heard by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what did he do? He knew that these people uh, are trying to save their faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped her, them by in 11. We see then we cast a cover over their ears in, in the cave for a number of years. Then we awaken them that we make evident which of the two parties was best at calculating time they had remained. So here Allah made them sleep for many, many years. Uh, he, he covered their ears, um, meaning that they couldn't hear any of the noises, the sounds that would disturb them. And then Allah says over there that then he woke them up. And so uh, we see this is, you know, this is something that happened and they were again woken up and we will continue this surah and we will learn the details coming further. Art number 12. 
then we awaken them and we make evident which of the two parties was best at calculating the time that they remained. We narrate to you their story in truth. Indeed, they were youths who believed in their Lord and we increased them in guidance. When one believes in Allah, when one has Iman in their heart, then Allah increases the guidance. And then we are directed by Allah to choose the right path. Alhamdulillah. These are the, these are, this is the benefit of faith. This is the benefit of belief in one Lord. And ayat number 14, and we made firm their hearts when they stood up and said, our Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. We will never invoke besides him any God. Certainly, if we did, we would have then, then uttered an enormity. So the king had invited them, uh, you know, as we earlier said, that the king wanted them to accept their ways. And this king, uh, we are told, um, it is said that the king named Dicius used to exhort his subjects to worship idols and make offerings to them. But Allah guided the few young men to worship one God, the creator and Lord of the heavens and the earth. And um, we see that here, by and by the people came to know uh, of these youths' belief in one God. And finally, the news reached, had reached the king. He summoned them and questioned them uh, uh, about their belief. Thereupon, the youth told them, uh, you know, and the king, frankly, of their faith. Later, to save their f faith, they fled to the cave in the mountain, far from the town, out of the fear of king's persecution and that of the pagans of the town. There is, there in the cave, Allah made them sleep for, we will see further on, uh, for 300 and nine years um, and, uh, of the lunar calendar and 300 years of the solar candle calendar. We will see that further on. And here we are being told that these are people, these are people have taken gods besides him. Why do they not come to them with a clear authority? And who is more wrong than the one who invents lies against Allah. So the people of that time used to believe in many gods. And ayat number 16, and when you withdraw from them and that which they worship besides Allah, then retreat to a cave, your Lord will spread for you of his mercy and will facilitate for you your affair in ease. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitated them. They said, um, and they approached Allah. They said this beautiful dua. Allah facilitated them in the cave. And and in ayat number 17, we see that, and you might have seen the sun when it rose inclining away from the cave on the right and when it set passing away from them on the left while they lay in an open space thereof. That was from the signs of Allah. He whom Allah guides is the guided one and he whom he lets go astray. Never will you find for him a protecting, protecting guide. Allah protected them in the cave and uh, preserved them in their sleep. And um, uh, this was a miracle of Allah that the sun also didn't um, scorch them with heat. This, um, Allah made the, nat the, the forces of nature also be friendly towards these um, youths who were in the cave. And ayat number 18, and you would think them awake while they were asleep. And we turned them to the right and to the left while the dog stretched his forelegs at the entrance. If you had looked at them, surely you would have turned back from them in flight. In fl Light and would have been filled by them with terror. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them sleep in a cave and a, there was a dog, a big dog there stretched out. So if anybody came, they would be scared of the dog and they wouldn't approach these people. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I turned them, that they returned them from the right to the left. And so, you know how you, if you lie in one place for too long, you get sores. You know, patients in hospitals, when they lie in the bed and they are not they're not moved enough, then they get bed sores. So, um, um, and so the nurses and the doctors move them around so that they won't get wounds, they won't get sores. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moved them around so they won't get any sores, any, any um, you know, any problem in, with their bodies. So uh, uh, we will read um, the 18th ayat again and you would think of them awake and people thought they were awake while they were really asleep and we turned them to the right and to the left while their dog stretched his four legs at the entrance if you could have looked at them surely you would have turned back from them in flight and would have been filled 
with them in terror. So it was a scary, uh, a scary uh, way that everyone was just sleeping, or the, the kind of maybe, and the big dog. So people would, if people would come there, they would run away from there. And um, that is how Allah protected them and kept people uh, from finding out about them. Ayat number 19, and similarly, we awakened them that they might question one another. Set a speaker among them. How long have you remained? They said, we have remained a day or a part of the day. They said, your Lord knows best how long you remained. So send one of you with the silver coin of yours uh, to the city and let him see which food is purest there and bring to you provision from it and let him be cautious and let no one be aware about, uh, about you. So what happened then? Finally, they woke up. They woke up after many, many years. We will see further on in the, in the ayats. They were awakened and nothing was worn out. They were fresh. They were feeling good. And, um, and so now what are they saying? They're questioning each other. I, we, how long did we sleep? Nobody really knew. Nobody understood how long they slept. They're questioning each other. And then they say, okay, may Allah knows best how much we slept. We don't know. And then they, and then they say, let's, let's, let's one of us go with a silver coin and get some food. And here, if you can see the word purest, uh, the purest of foods they wanted because, you know, um, they were very careful about what they uh, consumed because they were in an area, they were, they were in a time where uh, idols were being worshipped and animals were slaughtered in the name of idols and they didn't want that kind of food. So they, they're so careful about what they consume. Uh, this is very important for us also. When we, the things that we eat in life, the things that we bring into our bodies should be... Um, if they're animals, they should be slaughtered in the name of Allah and they should be clean and hygienic and um, uh, we should not take anything that is haram. Ayat number 20, indeed, if they come to know about you, they will stone you or return to, uh, you to their religion. Then never will you succeed ever. So they're scared. They want to go out. They're hungry. They just woke up. They're hungry. Uh, and, and they, they, but they're scared because they're saying, don't let anybody know who you are, because they are going to go, try to force us into their religion. And that is no success. And then in ayat number 20, uh, 21, we see, and similarly, we made known about them to the people that they might know that the promise of Allah is true and that there is no doubt about the hour when they disputed among themselves about their affair and said, construct over them a structure their Lord knows best about them, said those who prevailed in their matter, surely we will take over them a place of worship. So now what happened was Allah is making, this person goes out. And of course, people realized that this person didn't belong because this was so many years after everything has changed. That king that was a tyrant, who was a, a, who was a, a polytheist, who, who worshipped idols is gone. So many years have passed. Now a Christian ruler is, is ruling this place and people realized that this person who's come with a silver coin is not one of us. People realize this because his language was different, his clothing was different, the currency he was carrying was different. Uh, so, uh, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in I-21, did um, construct over them a structure their Lord knows best about them, said those who prevailed in their matter, surely we will take over them a place of worship. So eventually when they find out and they go back to the cave and they find out about these youths, then um, they die and then they are buried. And um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is telling us that those people then constructed a structure over them. So this is what we are being told. And um, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah cursed the Jews and the Christians who chose uh, the graves of their prophets for masjids, Sahih Bukhari. So any uh, anytime any um, of our holy people pass away, their graves are not supposed to be uh, gone to, they're not supposed, we're not supposed to worship on their graves or anything. We're not, but they, they did construct some uh, something there. And then in ayat number 22, Ayat number 22, they say they were three and the fourth of them being their dog. And they say they were five and the sixth of them being their dog, guessing about the unseen. And they say they were seven and the eighth 
eighth of them was their dog. Say, my Lord knows best their number. None knows except a few. So do not argue about them except with an obvious argument and do not inquire about them from anyone. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the number of how many youths were there, that number is not important. Some say this, some say that. That is not important how many youths um, ran to the cave and how many uh, and how they slept and how they were woken up and how they were recognized. But that is not the important thing. The important thing is the lessons that we learn about the, the youth and their faith and how they wanted to save it. And ayat number 23, and do not say about anything. Indeed, I will do that tomorrow, except if Allah wills. And remember your Lord when you forget and say, perhaps my Lord will guide me to the nearer way than this right way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, in, this, in between this story, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also saying something very important for all of us to remember that if we ever speak about something in the future, we should say, inshallah. Um, we should say, inshallah, ta'ala, except if Allah wills. And remember your Lord when you forget. And say, perhaps my Lord will guide me to the nearer way than this right way. And then we go back to the story. You see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coming back and forth in this story. Alhamdulillah, Allah gives us some lessons. Then Allah tells us something else. And now back to the story in ayat number 25, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and they remained in their cave for 300 solar years and add nine for lunar years. This is how long they slept, subhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them sleep for 300 solar years and um, add nine for the lunar years. Say Allah knows best how long they remained. He has knowledge of the unseen, of the heavens and the earth. How clearly he sees and how clearly he hears. They do not have besides him any protector and he does not share his command with anyone. This is the beauty of Allah, the knowledge of Allah, that he's all seer, all hearer. Uh, he is the protector and he has command over everything. Then we go out on to ayat number 27 and recite what has been revealed to you of your book of, of your Lord. None can change his words and never will you find a refuge besides him. So here we see that there's no refuge but the refuge of Allah and keep yourself patient with those who call their Lord in the morning and in the evening desiring his face and let not your eyes pass beyond them desiring adornment of the worldly life and do not obey one whose heart we have made heedless of our remembrance and who follows his desires and whose affair has gone beyond bounds. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is telling us that we should be in the company of the righteous um, and keep yourself patient with those who call their Lord in the morning and the evening. We should always remain with people who remember Allah a lot and we should not get um, greedy about people who have more than us in this worldly life. Um, and uh, we should not be heedless in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, um, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, he says, we have made he, um, and obey one whose heart we have, and, and, and do not obey one whose heart we have made heedless uh, of our remembrance and who follows his desires and whose affair has gone beyond all bounds and say, the truth is from your Lord. So whoever wills, let him believe and whoever wills, let him disbelieve. Indeed, we have prepared for the wrongdoers fire though whose walls will surround them and if they call for relief they will be relieved with water like molten brass which will scald their faces wretched is the drink and evil is the resting place so uh, we you know um, we're told that how bad um, hell is and what is given there to drink and may Allah keep us away from this indeed those who believe and do good deeds indeed we will not let go waste the reward of anyone who does good deeds. And so we are, ayat number 30, indeed those who believe and do good deeds, indeed we will not let go waste the reward of anyone who does good deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so caring, so kind, and so he values each and every good deed that we do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never lets go any good, good deed. 
smallest of deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps a record of it. A smile to your brother, your sister, um, a kind gesture, a pat on the back. Um, you know, if you're a teacher giving, uh, giving uh, you know, well done, uh, um, you know, acknowledging somebody's work, um, alhamdulillah, um, bringing a glass of water to your mom or dad. All, and, and in ayat number 30, we see indeed those who believe and do good deeds. Indeed, we will not let go waste the reward of anyone who does good deeds. So any good deed is always uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is appreciative of it. And, um, you know, uh, we go on to 31. Those will have gardens of Eden underneath which rivers flow therein with bracelets of gold and will wear green garments of fine silk and heavy brocade reclining therein on adorned couches. Excellent is the reward and good is the resting place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give so much to us in Jannah, in the Garden of Eden. There were going to be rivers that flow and bracelets of gold and green garments and fine silk and heavy brocade and couches, a, a time of luxury, time of comfort, time of relaxation. Alhamdulillah, may Allah make us of those who can achieve this by the mercy of Allah. We have to strive throughout our lives to gain good deeds, inshallah ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, uh, we are on ayat number 31 and uh, four rukus have gone by. And uh, we covered a few very, very important lessons here. Alhamdulillah, the youths who, who valued their faith and wanted to save their faith and how Allah put them to sleep and then woke them up. And the, the, air, the, air, the area and the time when they woke up was totally different than the time that they had left. And how people of that town who knew that there was a story about the youth there was this history behind it. You know, the people of that town knew that they were long time ago, some youths had uh, run away from a king who was a tyrant too. And, and now they believed because these youths came back to life and now were in their market and in their place that, that the people of that time realized that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can put somebody to sleep for so long. The the lesson of resurrection, the lesson of coming back to life after death, after sleep, is what the, the people were confirmed and they, were, they understood, of course, if Allah could make these youths sleep for so long and then bring them back to life, then Allah can surely bring us back to life after we die. So this was reiterated, this was reinforced, this idea of resurrection is what is, uh, alhamdulillah, that came about from this story of the youths and how they saved their faith, alhamdulillah. And we also uh, saw in the this um, that um, that we saw also that in the word inshallah uh, that uh, the Jews asked three questions to the Messenger of Allah, uh, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to test him: What is the rule, which is the spirit or soul? Who were the people of the cave? And who was Zulkarnain? The the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied to these Jews, I will answer your questions tomorrow. But the revelation about it did not come for 15 days. When Jibreel Islam delivered the revelation, Allah told his messenger to say, if Allah wills. The word tomorrow in, the wor in that verse that we saw earlier, it means future. That is when you intend to do something in the near or distant future, you should say, if Allah wills, because a man never knows whether Allah will let him do what he has resolved to do. So, so uh, here we see that uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had also said that tomorrow I'll give you an answer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us and teaching Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa always to say inshallah. Uh, and so we now we will continue with the rest of the ayats inshallah. And, and we begin with ayat number 32. A new story is being mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here in ayat number 32. And set forth to them and the example of two men. We provided for one of them two gardens of grapes and we bordered them with date palms and placed fields of crops between them. So here is uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us about two men. One of them was very, very wealthy. 
He had many, many lands and on their lands, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying there were grapes, gardens of grapes bordered by date palms. Can you imagine how the beauty? And there were, there were crops, many crops. And night number 33, we see each of the two gardens brought forth its produce and did not fall short thereof in anything. And we caused to gush forth within them a river. So the, he, this man had two gardens and all the fruit and all the produce was the best quality one. They, they, it, you know, when you, where, where you see they're off in it, um, it did not fall short, did not fall short. So we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had this quality fruit and quality produce there. And then uh, we caused to gush forth within them, a, a, a river was there even. This is a gar two gardens, grapes, dates, crops, quality fruit, and a river. Allah gave this man everything. And um, then in ayat number 34, we see, and he had fruits, uh, and he had fruit. So he said to his companion while he was talking to him, I'm greater than you in wealth and stronger in respect of men. So now this man is boasting about what he has and he's telling his, the other person who is with him that I am greater than you in wealth and stronger in, in respect to men. And so he's being self-confident, he's relying on himself, he's overconfident and he's boasting and all these things Allah doesn't like. So in ayat number 35, we see, and he entered his garden while he was unjust to himself and he said, I do not think that this will ever perish. So he said, to the other companion, he said, I don't think this can ever end. What I have will last forever, forever. So this is the delusion of this man that his wealth will last forever. And, um, and so we go on to ayat number 36. Uh, we see here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the English, tra English translation is, and I do not think the hour will come. And even if I am brought back to my Lord, I will surely find better than this as a return. So he, he had doubts about the hereafter. And then he said, if there is a hereafter, I'll be given something good, uh, better than this. Then in ayat number 37, we see his companion said to him while he was talking with him, do you disbelieve in one who created you from dust, then from a minute quantity of semen, then fashioned you into a man? So this companion is making him remember the, uh, the origin of humanity and how we, the origin of the individual, how we are created and how we come to life. And so uh, uh, then he says in ayat number 38, but as for me, he is Allah, my Lord, and I do not associate anyone with my Lord. So here's a, his companion who is on pure monotheism, he's on pure tawheed, we are oneness of Allah, and he says, I don't associate anyone with my Lord. And then, so this man is being, uh, the way Allah is talking about him and telling us about him is he's a God-fearing man. He's a righteous person. Ayat number 39. And why did you not say when you entered your garden, what Allah wills, there is no power except with Allah, although you see me less than you in wealth and children. So this is a true believer. Uh, this is the mark of moment who says that, why didn't you say when you entered your garden, what Allah wills? This is, this is mashallah. May Allah keep it that way, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. This is so important to say when you are praising something, even if you're praising your own thing, um, even if you're saying something good about your own thing or anybody else, you should say mashallah. And so he, this man is letting him know that and uh, we see Hadith says, if you see something delightful concerning your brother, you should supplicate asking Allah to bless him because the evil eye does what, but because the evil eye does is real. This is in Sunan Ibn Majah, Hadith number 3509. So Alhamdulillah, we are being told uh, how Allah trains us, how Allah guides us. He, Allah is saying that if you see something joyous, something delightful, something that is uh, pleasing to your eyes, you should, you should say, MashaAllah, la quwata illa billah. Alhamdulillah, may Allah help us always to remember that because evil eye is, is uh, true. And so um, we want Allah's blessings in whatever we see 
in whatever we do, inshallah ta'ala. So then, um, then we go on to ayat number 40. It may be that my Lord will give me better than your garden and will send upon it your garden, a calamity from the sky, and it will become a slippery ground. Um, so this moment, this companion, is letting the other one who is boastful and uh, arrogant and feels very self-reliant understand that things can perish, things can finish, that everything is temporary in this world. And if Allah wants, he can, he can finish the garden. And at number 41, or its water will become sunken into the earth so you would never be able to find it. And so this companion is saying that it could also happen that this river that you have, Allah will make it dry, make it uh, make the ground absorb the water and you will have no water. Anything can happen. And then 42, and his, his fruits were surrounded by ruin. So he began twisting his hands over what he had sp spent on it while it, it had collapsed upon its trellises. And he said, oh, I wish I had not associated anyone with my Lord. So here the truth comes out that this, this person did associate mm, and did believe in partners with Allah. And also what happens, what happened, what has happened in ayat number 42? What has happened is that his entire, the two gardens were swallowed, were, were swallowed by the ground. They kind of, they, it was just like the earth opened up and everything got <clears throat> taken away from him. So we read number 42 again. And, he, and his fruits were surrounded by ruin. So he began twisting his hands over what he had spent on it while it had collapsed upon its trellises. And he said, oh, I wish I had not associated anyone with my Lord. So only when the garden had been destroyed did he realize he had committed a major sin by ascribing partners to Allah. And uh, ayat number 43. And he had no group to help him other than Allah, nor was he supported. So he was helpless now. Everything was ruined. Ayat number 44. There, the protection is only from Allah, the true. He is the best to reward and the best for the final end. So may we always turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the only protector. He is the only one that can reward the good and punish the bad. Ayat number 45 and present to them an example of the life of the world. It is like the water which we send down from the sky. Then the vegetation of the earth mingles with it. Then it becomes dry stalk, which are scattered by the winds. And Allah is able to do all things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining that uh, the example of the world, um, it is like the water which we send down from the sky. Then the vegetation on the earth mingles with it. Then it becomes dry stalk, which is scattered by the winds. And Allah is able to do all things. So this is the cycle of life. Things become much, uh, things are uh, start in the beginning. Then they become mature. Then they bloom. Then they become very, you know, be beautiful. And then they start withering. And then they die. And that is the circle of life for humanity. Also, at number forty-six, wealth and children are the adornment of the life of this world. But the enduring good deeds are better in sight of your Lord for reward, for reward and better in respect of hope. So the, the wealth and the children that we have in this world, they are just for this world. But what good we do endures forever. Uh, so good Muslims make an intention that their wealth and their children are dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we bring up our children with the best nurturing, that we bring up our children with the best tarbiya, that we use our assets, anything that Allah has given, it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we use our wealth in the name of Allah, for the cause of Allah, for the propagation of Islam, for goodness, to help others, to share with others who are less. Ayat number 47, and the day we will cause the mountains to move and you will see the earth as a leveled plain and we will gather them and we will not leave behind any from them. So there will be a day where then the mountains will move and the earth will be leveled and this whole earth, planet earth will be changed. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so, um, so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and they will be presented before your Lord in rows and we, 
he will say, certainly you have come to us just as we created you the first time. Nay, you claimed that we had not made for you an appointment. So there will be a day that we will all be standing in rows in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, that is the appointed day that is bound to come. We need to believe in that, that we, there is a day that Allah has designated for accountability. Ayat number 49 and the book of deeds will be placed and you will see the criminals fearful of what it is in it and they will say woe to us what is this book that leaves nothing small or great except that it has been enumerated in it and they will find what they did presented before them and your Lord will not deal unjustly with anyone so it will be a book of our, everything is going to be written of what we did in our lives. And then we're going to say, what kind of book is this? It has noted out everything. Things we don't even remember uh, that we forget, that we take casually, we are careless. Everything is noted, ayat number 50. And when we said to the angels, prostrate to Adam. So they prostrated except Iblis. He was of the jinn and he rebelled against the command of his Lord then will you take him and his offspring as protectors other than me while they are enemies to you? Wretched is the exchange for the wrongdoers. So here um, again, a beautiful story, the, the creation of humanity, the creation of Adam uh, and here Adam al Islam. And when we said to the angels prostrate to Adam, uh, um, so they prostrated except Iblis. Iblis was a jinn. He was a jinn who was allowed to sit with the angels he was a great worshiper and it is said that 70,000 years he worshiped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but then he rebelled he didn't listen to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we see in ayat 51 I did not make them witness the creation of the heavens and the earth nor their own creation and I would not have taken the misleaders as helper so and so we are you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing amazement that this is uh, the devil this is iblis who rejected my command and why are we uh, following his footsteps why do we think the shaitan is powerful and why and and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you know um, that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth and th th these are created things so then why do we follow the steps of the devils uh, they are created beings and Allah is the creator. Therefore, Allah deserves to be worshipped. Only Allah deserves to be worshipped. Ayat number 52. And the day when we will say, call those whom you claim to, to be my partners, then they will call them, but they will not respond to them. And we will make a barrier between them. And the criminals will see the fire and they will be certain that they are to fall in it and they will not find from it a way to escape. And certainly we have explained in the Quran every example for mankind, but man is in most things quarrelsome. We useless debates, useless quarrels, useless discussions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes everything very clear in the Quran and nothing prevents man from believing when guidance has come to them and from asking forgiveness of their Lord, except that comes to them in the way of the former people of comes to them, the punishment before them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically is saying that uh, that is if if these people disbelieve, they will suffer destruction of the early, just like the earlier people did. And that is the Makkan pagans um, were waiting for one of two things, uh, destruction, uh, or, um, uh, and they, they didn't think because they kept saying, bring in the punishment. And um, they, didn't want to, they didn't want to believe that anything, anything about what uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was giving them as messages. They totally wanted to defy everything. Ayat number 56, and we did not send the messengers except as bearer of glad tidings and as warners. And those who disbelieve dispute with falsehood to attempt to refute the truth thereby. And they take my verses and that of which they are warned in ridicule. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all the messengers with good news and with warnings. 
but these people they always believed they thought it was false they and um they used to make fun and all that is being described in ayat number 36 and an ayat, 30, uh, ayat number 56 i'm sorry and ayat number 57 and who is more wrong than he who is reminded of the verses of the Lord but turns away from them and forgets that his hands ha have set forth? Indeed, we have placed coverings over their hearts, lest they understand it, and in their ears is deafness. And if you call them to guidance, then never will they be guided. So this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically it puts a cover on on the hearts of people who are defiantly disappeared. The disobedient who are continuous sinners and who continuously mock the messages of Allah. Ayat number 58. And your Lord is the most forgiving, full of mercy. If he were to seize them for what they have earned, he would have hastened for them the punishment. But for them is an appointed time from which they will never find an escape. So there's an appointed time for everything and there's no escape when the time comes. Ayat number 59. And those towns, we destroyed them when they were wronged and we made for their destruction an appointed time. And now Hazrat Musa al Islam is being mentioned in ayat number 60. And when Musa said to his boy servant, I will not cease until I reach the junction of the two seas or continue for a long time. So here is the third story of this Surah Kahaf, Alhamdulillah. This story is about Hazrat Musa and Hazrat Khizr. And the fact that Hazrat Musa is being told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there's a person who has more knowledge than you and um, you can go and learn from him also. And here, uh, Musa al -Islam under, undertook this journey because a man had asked him who was the most knowledgeable among the people. Musa al -Islam replied that he was the most knowledgeable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided Musa uh, to find the person who knew more. So Allah revealed to Musa al-Islam that there was this another person who, from whom even Musa al-Islam could learn. So Musa al-Islam longed to see him and asked Allah how he could meet him. Allah told him that he would find that man where the two seas meet. He also told him to carry the fish in his basket and that when the fish departed there, he would find the one he longed to see. This is recorded in Sahih Bukhari, Hadith number 4725. So he did take the fish with him, and we will see that now. So Hazrat Musa al-Islam wanted to meet uh, Hazrat Khizr al-Islam here. And so we are told in Ayat 60, and when Musa said to his boy servant, this is Yusha bin Nun, um, I, that is the name that comes in the books, I will not cease until I reach the junction of the two seas or continue for a long period. So now Hazrat Musa is adamant inshallah to find this person but when they reached the junction between them they forgot their fish and it took its course into the sea slipping away so the fish that was supposed they were carrying went into the sea here and um they uh, and then in item number 62 then when they passed beyond it he musa said to his boy servant bring us our morning meal Certainly we have suffered fatigue in this journey. They were worn out, they were traveling, they're now very tired, they wanna eat some food. And at number 63, he said, did you see when we retired to the rock? Indeed, I forgot the fish and none made me forget it except the shaitan and I should mention it, that I should mention it and it took its course into the sea amazingly. So the, per the person that was with Hazrat Musa al Islam, he said that the fish actually went into the water where the rock was. So then what Hazrat Musa said, let's go back there because that is where we were supposed to find Hazrat Khizr. So here in Ayat 64, Musa al-Islam says, um, he, Musa said, that is what we were seeking. So they returned tracing their footsteps. So they walked back. And uh, here we see how, 
how Hazrat Musa al -Islam never got angry. He never reprimanded um, the person that was with him. And they just quietly went back to that place. And when they went back to the place where the fish had escaped and gone into the water, then in Ayat number 65, we see, and they, they found a servant from among our servants to whom we had given mercy from us. And we had taught him knowledge from us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's servant, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's person, a person with extra knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are told as Azad Khizr, and here they meet. Uh, and um, that person, according to authentic hadith, was Khizr, who called because who was called Khizr because, as he sat down on the white earth, as he sat down once on the white earth, it became green. Khizr means green and lush. This is recorded in Sahih Bukhari hadith number three four zero two. And so we see here that uh, now they are meeting each other. And in ayat number sixty six. Musa said to him, may I follow you on the condition that you teach me from what you have been taught of the right guidance? So Hazrat Musa al -Islam is asking Hazrat Khizr, can I go with you? Can you teach me the things that, and that you have been taught of the right guidance? And then in 67, he said, indeed, you will never be able to have patience with me. Hazrat Khizr says, whatever is going to happen, you're not going to be able to have patience with me. And how can you have patience for what you do not encompass in your knowledge? So whatever you're going to see, it will be very difficult for you to have patience because it's something that you do not have in your knowledge, this understanding. But then in ayat number 69, he, Musa, said, if Allah wills, inshallah. See, he uses the word inshallah, mashallah, this is so nice. So if Allah wills, you will find me patient and I will not disobey your order. And then in ayat number 70, we see he said, when it, and then he said, then if you follow me, do not ask me about anything until I mention it to you. Hazrat Khizr is putting some instructions. He's saying when I'm doing whatever I have to do, do not uh, mention it at that time. Um, and so then in ayat number 71, so they both set out until when they had embarked on the ship, he made a hole in it. So they went on a ship, but, uh, as a Khizar made a hole in it, he, Musa, said, have you made a hole in it to drown the people? Certainly you have done a grave thing. So he couldn't keep himself, he, he couldn't keep to himself. He needed to say something, and so he did. He said, well, you know, why have you made this hole? It's going to drown the people. Uh, this is not a good thing. This is a grave thing. In ayat number 72, we see he said, did I not say that you will never be able to have patience with me? As is saying, remember I told you that you were not going to be able to be, be uh, patient with me. And then in ayat number 73, we see that he, Musa said, do not blame me for what I forgot and do not be hard upon me in my affair raising this difficulties. He said, I forgot and please don't be hard on me. And then in ayat number 74, then, then they both set out until they met a, a boy. Then he killed him. He, Musa said, have you killed a pure soul for other than having killed soul? Certainly you have done an evil thing. And then when they went further on, Hazrat Khizr uh, uh, al killed a boy and Hazrat Musa al -Islam could not refrain himself. He said, why have you killed this pu pu poor, pure soul? Certainly you have done an evil thing. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Today we're going to continue with Juz 16 and we're going to continue with Surah Kahaf. Inshallah Ta'ala, as we have covered 74 ayats of Surah Kahaf, the cave already. Here in this Juz, Qala Alam, we are going to cover 75th ayat to 110 ayat, um, 75 to 110 verses. Then, by Allah's mercy, inshallah, we will begin a beautiful surah called Surah Maryam, verses 1 to 98, inshallah ta'ala. And by Allah's mercy, we will cover uh, Surah Taha, um, ayats 1 to 135. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to cover this beautiful juz in a beautiful way. And at the completion of this juz, we are going to look at commitment points from the previous paras that we have covered. May Allah bless you all, may Allah guide you all, may Allah 
protect everyone. Amen. We will go on to ayat number 75, which is in para number 16, inshallah ta'ala. Ayat number 75. He said, did I not tell you that you would never be able to have patience with me? Again, this is the second time that Khizr al-Islam is saying this to Hazrat Musa al-Islam. In 76, he, Musa said, if I ask you about anything after this, then do not keep me as your companion. Verily, you have received an excuse from me. So he said, if I do this again, if I again disturb you, interrupt you, ask a question, wonder why you've done something, then you can, mm, then I, you know, it says, he, Musa said, if I ask you about anything after this, then do not keep me as a companion. Verily, you have received an excuse from me. Give me one, he's asking for one more time, one more chance. So in Ayat 77, we see, so they set out until when they came to a people of a town, they asked its people for food, but they refused to offer them hospitality. Then they found they're in a wall uh, about to collapse. So he set it straight. He, Musa al-Islam said, if you wished, surely you could have taken a payment for it. So here they are in a town and this, they're hungry, they want food. They want people to take care of them. You know, we're supposed to take care of travelers. This is part of um, the their instructions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if there's a traveler in your city or in your town, you're supposed to take care of them. And that was the culture of that time too. But these people, they refused to take care of um, Hazrat Musa al-Islam and Hazrat Khizar and um, the, the Yusha ibn Noon. So here... Um, and so here we see that um, these people were not helpful at all. But then Hazrat Khizr saw uh, some wall falling down, uh, a wall that he reinforced and um, he made it stand up again, erect, proper. And um, there is a hadith which says, Khizr touched the wall with his hand and it straightened miraculously upon Allah's command as is clear from the authentic hadith of Al-Bukhari, uh, Sahih Al-Bukhari hadith 4726. So he fixed the wall, you know, with Allah's help, he fixed the wall. Uh, and uh, then Hazrat Musa said, but you, if, if you, you, you have fixed their wall, you could have asked for payment because if, if they give you money for it or if, uh, anything, then we would be able to buy food or something. You should have asked for payment. Then what happens in ayat number 78, he said, this is it. This is the parting between me and you. I will inform you of the interpretation of, of that about which you were unable to have patience. So as Khizr al-Islam says, okay, now this is it. This was the last time, your last chance. Now um, we will have to part, but before we part, I'll explain you why I did what I did. And nothing that Hazrat Khizr did Hazrat Khizr al-Islam, nothing that he did, he did on his own. It was the commandment of Allah. It was the knowledge for, of Allah. It was the wisdom of Allah that made him do what he did. It was nothing that he did on his own. These were the instructions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so then we see, now we will see the interpretations. In ayat number 79, he has long to the poor people working at sea. So I intended to cause a defect in it as there was a king pursuing them who seized every ship by force. So here, um, Hazrat Khizr al-Islam is explaining to Musa al-Islam that the reason why I made a hole in that ship is because there was this a tyrant king who was confiscating all the boats. Maybe he wanted to go to war or something. It was taking boats from all the poor people. Uh, but if the boat would have had a defect, then of course he wouldn't take it. It wouldn't be a boat useful for him. So uh, Hazrat Khizar made a hole in it so that that man who owned the boat would retain his boat and later on can fix it. It's easier to fix a boat than to get a whole new boat or make a new boat. So he made it easy for him. That is why he made a hole. So the king would not take that boat. And then Hazrat Khizar, Khizar al-Islam in ayat number 80 says, and as for the boy, his parents were believers and we feared that he would overburden them by transgression and disbelief. So uh, Hazrat, uh, Khizr al-Islam is explaining to Hazrat Musa al-Islam that the boy that I killed, his parents are believers and that it, 
and we feared that he would overburden them by transgression and disbelief. So this boy who at that time didn't seem like anything wrong with him, but Allah knew that if this boy grew up, he would be rebellious and he would not, he would, he would, he would transgress and he wouldn't be kind to his parents. Uh, it says overburden them by transgression and disbelief and that he would not be on Tawheed. So it was something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Hazrat Khizr to do so that these parents who were believers would not have to go through that agony with this child. Ayat number 61. So we intended that their Lord would change for them one better than him in purity and near in affection. So um, Hazrat Khizr Islam is explaining to Hazrat Musa Islam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to give them a nicer child, a better child, pure, who uh, better than him in purity and near in affection, or a loving, kind child. At number 82. And as for the wall, it belonged to two orphan boys in the town, and underneath it was a treasure for them, and their father had been righteous. So your Lord intended that they reach maturity and bring forth their treasure as a mercy from your Lord and I did not do it on my accord. That is the interpretation of what, of that about which you were unable to have patience. So now the third event that had occurred, he, uh, Hazrat Khidr al-Islam is explaining to Hazrat Musa al-Islam that, that the reason why I fixed that wall is because it belonged to two orphans in the town. And underneath that wall was a treasure uh, that the father had kept uh, because he was a righteous man and he kept this treasure for these um, young boys to grow up to maturity and then take it and, and it will be helpful to them then so your lord intended that they reach maturity and bring forth their treasure as a mercy from their lord and i did not do it on my own accord that is the interpretation of about which you were unable to have patience so as the Khizr al-Islam says, uh, the reason why I fixed the wall, because it was a commandment from Allah. I wanted to save the, tre the tre uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to save the treasure inside, uh, underneath the wall, for the orphans to reach maturity and then use it then. And then uh, as the Khizr al-Islam says, these are the interpretations. I didn't do anything on my own. These were the commandments for, of Allah. So here is the knowledge that was given to Khizr al-Islam was not with Hazrat Musa al-Islam. It's how Allah gives, who Allah gives to, what knowledge one has is all from Allah. Ayat number 83. Now a different story is being mentioned here. The fourth story of Surah Kahaf. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in 80, ayat number 83, the translation in English is, and they say, I will recite to you a remembrance about him. Now, Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was being asked these questions. And one of the questions was about Zulkarnan. Indeed, we established him on earth and we gave him means of access to everything. So he followed a course. He went on an expedition. And so he followed a course, which uh, he was, went on an expedition. He was a man who would go from, to, he would travel many lands and help the people who needed help. He was a man, he was a leader. He was a man of power. He had resources. He didn't use it uh, uh, to uh, subjugate people, but he used his resources for help. He was a good man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ayat number 86, until when he reached the setting place of the sun. He found it as if setting in a spring of dark mud. He found a community near it. We said, O oh, Zulkarnan, either you punish them or treat them with goodness. So he said, as for the ones who, ro who wrongs soon, we will punish him. Then he will be returned to his Lord and he will punish him with the terrible punishment. So here is a person, Zulkarnan. He is preaching the oneness of Allah. And he wants to stop the wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him to stop wrong in, the, in these communities where he's going and to propagate good. In ayat number 88, see, but as for the one who believes and does righteous deeds, then he will have a good reward and he will speak to him from our command with ease. And he followed a, a course. Um, so he's continuing to go from one place to another. And here we see in ayat 90, Zul, uh, until he reached, Zulkarnan reached, the rising place of the sun. He found it as if rising on a community for whom we had not made against the sun any shelter. So if this was open ground, open land, lots of sun, 
Then in ayat number 91, we see, thus we had encompassed all that he had of the information and we followed a, and he followed a course again he's going further into different lands and you know helping out people and propagating the oneness of allah and stopping trying to stop wrong and until when he reached between the two mountains now he's in an area which is between two mountains he found besides them a community <coughs> a community who could hardly understand his speech so here are people who speak a different language. And so uh, number 94, they said, O Zulkarnan, indeed Yajuj and Mayajuj are corruptors in the land. So may we assign for you an expenditure that you might make a barrier between us and them. So these people are, are wanting to be rescued from these people of Yajuj and Majuj. They're saying that they're corruptors of the land. They want to separate from them. So he said that in which my Lord has established me is better, but assist me with strength. I will make between you and them a barrier. So these, these people said, we are going to give you, we're, we're going to give you money or wealth. Please help us and make something a barrier between us. Then Zulkarnan says, but what Allah has given me is much better. You don't have to give me anything. I don't want any reward. I just want you to help me uh, with strength. Um, we need naturally human resources needed to make a barrier. So then, uh, uh, then he says, bring me sheets of iron. Uh, Zulkarnan says, bring me sheets of iron. Until when he had leveled between the two cliffs, he said, blow. Until when he had made it like fire, he said, bring me molten copper to pour over it. Now here's uh, Zulkarnan. He has the understanding of how to make a very solid wall. And this is the space between the mountains where he's making this wall, is giving instructions to bring copper and pour over it. And then in 1997, so they were not able to scale it, nor were they able to penetrate it. So now the wall is constructed, it is solid, it is not penetrable. And now the Yajuj and Majuj are on one side and this community is on the other side. And now they have a barrier like they wanted. So Zulkarnan was very helpful to this community. He, Zulkarnan, said, this is a mercy from my Lord, but when, my, when the promise of my Lord comes, he will make it level, and the promise of my Lord is true. After all this work, he thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zulkarnan thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, this knowledge that I have of building this wall has come to me by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who has helped me, and this is, the, this is a, a true moment, a true believer in Allah, and thanks Allah for everything. He doesn't claim that he is, a, he is the all knowledge, knowledgeable, that he had this talent. No, he thanked Allah for everything that had happened. And um, so here we see, and also Zulkarnan here says that um, Allah can make this a level, meaning again, this, this wall can break. Allah can uh, make it disappear. Allah can level this wall because um, here, the promise of Allah refers to the time when Yajuj and Majuj, as the Hadith says, will break out and abound from their land, spreading all over the earth. Uh, so, for example, according to Hadith, Messenger of Allah وسلم, interpreted the hole in the barrier as a prelude to promised affliction. This is in Sahih Bukhari. So one day this barrier is going to be leveled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Yajuj and Majuj will come out of it. And so, uh, um, and he, and the promise of my Lord is true. That is what um, is being told to us in item number 98. And then in 99, and on that day, we will leave them surging over each other. They will come like waves, these people, will, surging over each other. And the trumpet will be blown and we will gather them all together. This will be something that will happen very close to the end of time. Ayat number 100. And on that day, we will, we will present hell to the disbelievers on display. Hell will be seen by everyone and those whose eyes had been within a cover of my remembrance and they were unable to hear. So um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there will be a day where everybody was going to stand in front of him for accountability and the hell will be shown and people who were not remembering Allah in this world will realize how wrong they were. In Ayat 102, we see then 
do those who disbelieve think that they can take my servants as protectors besides me? Indeed, we have prepared hell for the disbelievers as a lodging. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, how can servants of Allah, how can people of Allah be, be called as gods? They cannot save you from hell. These people cannot save you from, from hell, the people that you preach. And, you know, many, many people also uh, worshipped uh, idols, slaves of Allah, the angels of Allah, even some people um, worship Hazrat Isa, like this surah began with, uh, with the fact that, you know, uh, it's, it's a very incorrect to say that Allah has a son. And uh, so there are different kinds of people in this world who worship devils and jinns and people and and mazars and temples and all kinds of things so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says then 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 do then do those who think then do those who disbelieve think that they can make my servants as protectors besides me how can my servants um be the uh, you know have any part of me indeed we have prepared hell for the disbelievers as a lodging and, send, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayat number 103, the English translation is, say, shall we inform you of the greatest losers as to their deeds? Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the greatest losers of, in this world. Those whose efforts in, is lost in the life of this world while they think that they were acquiring good by their work. So here are people who thought that they were successful, but uh, actual success is the success that Allah has told us, told us about. The success that one can achieve only from Tawheed and only from good deeds. Ayat number 105, they are those who disbelieve in the verses of their Lord and in the meeting of, with him. So their deeds are in vain and we will not assign to them their deeds any weight on the day of resurrection. So anybody who doesn't believe in one God uh, their deeds are not counted. I'd 106, they're, they're good, uh, 106, that is their recompense, hell, because they disbelieved and took my verses and my messengers in ridicule. There are so many signs that Allah has put in this world. Signs are all in the Quran, signs in the nature, signs in your own body. All this thing was ignored. All these things, all these things were pointing to one creator, but they were ignored and made ridicule of. Uh, the, the result of mocking is, of course, hell. And indeed, those who believe and do righteous deeds, they will have gardens of paradise a lodging. May Allah make us of those who uh, believe and do righteous deeds and eventually, by Allah's mercy, gain paradise, inshallah ta'ala. And Jannat Firdos is the highest level of paradise. The Messenger of Allah said, when you pray, pray for paradise. Ask Allah to give you Al Firdos because that is the highest and the middle part of paradise. From there, all streams of paradise gush forth. This is a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, hadith number 7423. So we see then in ayat number 108 they will abide in it forever they will not desire any transfer from it once one reaches the highest success of course one doesn't want any change in that and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the English translation is I 109 say if the sea were ink for the writing the words of your Lord surely the sea would be exhausted before the words of my Lord were exhausted even if we brought the like of it as a supplement so the beauty of Allah, the grandeur of Allah, the creation of Allah, the majesty of Allah is such that one cannot put it in words, you know. If the sea were ink for writing the words of my Lord, surely the sea would be exhausted before the words of my Lord were exhausted. Even if we brought the like of it as a supplement. So there's no way to describe Allah. Even if a sea, if we start writing and the, ones, and the pen starts writing and the sea is the ink and then another sea is replaced still, 
the beauty of Allah cannot be explained. The majesty of Allah cannot be explained. The words of Allah it also mean um, his names and attributes and all the signs and portents that prove Tawheed. The human mind cannot encompass them all for they are limitless. If all the trees were made into pens and the seas plus the like of thereof were turned into ink, the words of Allah would not be exhausted. And then we see the last ayat of this beautiful surah, ayat number 110, say, I'm only a man like you. It has been revealed to me that your God is only one God. So whoever hopes for the meeting with his Lord, let him do righteous deeds and not associate anyone in the worship of his Lord. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is saying to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, say, I'm only a man like you. That Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is only a man. And it has been revealed to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that God is only one God. And whoever hopes in meeting his Lord, what should he do? Let him do righteous deeds and not associate anyone in the worship of his Lord. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Beautiful surah with so many lessons. Lessons of courage and hijrat and company of the righteous. And the garden and... Um, you know, uh, and relying on Allah and Hazrat uh, Musa alayhi salam and uh, how Allah is the master of destiny and Allah knows reality and and uh, in Zulkarnan's story we learned that of course uh, sci uh, Islam uh, does not forbid science or technology the technology that uh, Zulkarnan had is is valued and, and that all knowledge comes from Allah and when Allah gives um, to you, he gives because uh, 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 when you do something for Allah, Allah honors you and Allah gives you the best. When you ask for guidance, Allah gives guidance, Allah gives safety for those who ask for safety. So many lessons in this. May Allah help us to connect with this surah, to learn it more in depth, and to understand the gems of this surah again and again, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, we have completed Surah Kahf. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, truly it is Allah, supremely it is only Allah that takes people from one step to another, from one stage to another, makes Allah, Allah makes us progress forward, this is Allah's will that we go forward, Alhamdulillah, in this beautiful month of Ramadan, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has kept us connected with his kalam, that whatever little effort we make, may Allah uh, accept it. Whatever mistakes we have made, whatever mistakes I have made, may Allah forgive me. And Ameen. And also we say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that beautiful things we are learning, beautiful messages of Allah. Let's review Juz 10, 11, and 12. And um, if we can, if we have time, we'll review 13 also. And make some commitments and just uh, revise a few things that we covered in these Juz. Okay, so as we look at Juz 10, we want to make a commitment that inshallah should be not by the angels of punishment. So we saw that in Surah An Anfal, we, 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 Allah told us that the good souls, the good people, their souls are taken by angels of mercy and uh, bad souls are taken by angels of punishment. So we Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's make a commitment to remember to pray. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know when I die, make the angels of mercy take me, take my soul, Allah. Make me such a human being that the angels of mercy would like to take me. Ameen. Surah An-Anfal, Surah number 8, Ayat number 50. And uh, then we look at the commitment number 2, that that the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love us is if we follow Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's footsteps. This was indicated in Surah An Anfal, Surah number 8, ayat number 64. Follow the teachings of your beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as it is the key to gaining Allah's way and love. May Allah make us of those who 
follow in the direction of Allah, the straight way, the straight way, Allah's straight way, right? Inshallah ta'ala. And so um, we go forward and we go to commitment number three. We want to make a commitment that we will remember the sacred months, which are Muharram, Rajab, Dhul Qada, Dhul Hijjah. And we must remember, we will make a commitment to remember that the reward for good deeds is multiplied during these months. And sins have serious consequences to keep away from sins always, but especially during these months. And, um, and to remember that to do good deeds all throughout our lives, but during this month we get special reward. So may our efforts always be better, um, inshallah. As we go to commitment number four from Jews number 10, we must remember Surah Tawbah, um, uh, Surah number 9, Ayat number 13 reminds us that never fear any person or anything or situation more than Allah. That the biggest fear of our ours should be displeasure of Allah, not any person or anything. Inshallah, may Allah make us remember not to displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, as we go forward in this uh, uh, juz, juz number 10, we have point number five. That Surah Tawbah also reminds us, Surah Tawbah, Surah number nine, ayat number 72 also reminds us that we should stop uh, being worried about approval of people. Ask for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ridwan, which is approval, pleasure. This is the best way that you can earn, that you can ever attain, that, that this is the best that you can ever attain. The best thing that we can attain is the pleasure of Allah, the approval of Allah, the ridwan of Allah. And let's stop being worried about what people say. If we know that what we are doing, Allah will like, then we should do it, inshallah. May Allah make us of those who understand this. Ameen. As we go on to the next Jews, in Jews 11, we covered Surah Tawbah. Alhamdulillah, we will look at the beautiful uh, points that Surah Tawbah is like letting us know, indicating towards. As we looked at Surah Tawbah, ayat number 100, we saw that we should all aim for good deeds. We should run towards good deeds. We should race toward good deeds. Race to do good deeds for the sake of Allah. Just like the Muhajirun and the Ansar of Medina at the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And has promised them the pleasure. And what did Allah promise these people who were the Mahajirun, who migrated for Allah's pleasure, who wanted to go in an area where they can worship Allah alone and be on Tawheed and, um, and then, or be like the Ansar who did good deeds by welcoming the Mahajirun, by welcoming the immigrants and giving them the best what, of what they had. And um, so Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, this all happened because of the beautiful leadership of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what did Allah grant them because of that? He promised, Allah promised them his pleasure and paradise. Alhamdulillah. So let's raise toward doing good deeds. Either we um, do the good deeds ourselves, which is the number one thing that we should do, or we should help others who are doing good deeds. Inshallah ta'ala. Either we should be the initiators or the supporters of good deeds, of Allah's, um, spreading Allah's word, inshallah ta'ala. And what will, what has Allah promised people like that? He's promised his pleasure and paradise. What else, what else could we want? Alhamdulillah. So we make a commitment that we will always be, uh, grab the opportunity to, to do good deeds whenever um, something, whenever there is a circumstance where we can actually help out, we will, whenever we can, make a difference and make things better, we will, inshallah, ameen. This is our commitment, inshallah, from Jews 11. As we go to uh, commitment number two from Jews 11, we must ask Allah, ask Allah that whatever you read, that whenever you read a surah or its translation, it increases you in iman. And iman means faith and, and action. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whenever we read the Quran Majid, whenever we read uh, its translation, it, that Allah help us to increase our iman. And this iman should be a very, very strong faith, should bring very, very strong faith in us and good actions, inshallah ta'ala. So as indicated in Surah At-Tawbah, 
Surah number 9 one, and Ayat 124. As we go forward to commitment number 3, we are looking at the last Ayat of Surah Tawbah. Last Ayat is 129, Surah Tawbah is Surah number 9. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in that uh, Ayat, but if they turn away from you, then tell them, in brackets, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah is sufficient for me. There is no deity but he, and I trust in him alone, the Lord of the glorious throne. Hasbi Allahu la ilaha illa huwa alayhi tawakaltu wa huwa rabbul arsh al azim. Alhamdulillah, this is a beautiful dua. This is a beautiful statement. There is no God, no deity, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He and I trust him alone. And he is the Lord of the glorious throne. Um, so we let's say let's make a commitment to say this beautiful dua, to say this beautiful beautiful dhikr, morning and evening seven times. This is a hadith of Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam um, that um, if we say it seven times in the morning and uh, and seven times in the evening every single day, Allah will grant you whatever you desire from this world and the next. This is Hadith recorded in Abu Dawood uh, and Ibn As-Sunni. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. May Allah make us of those who, who can remember to say this seven times in the morning and seven times in the evening. Ameen. Let's look at um, point number four, commitment number four from Juz 11. This is, Alhamdulillah, and know that the Day of Judgment is there to establish justice for each one of us. Let's remember that there will be true justice in the hereafter. And of course, we, we see this, Alhamdulillah, in Surah Yunus, ayat number four, um, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, To him shall you all ultimately return, and that is the true promise of Allah. It is he alone who originates in the process of the creation in the first instance and repeats it so that he may recompense with justice those who believed in him and did righteous deeds. But those who reject the existence of Allah will have boiling fluid for a drink and their chastenment shall be painful for blatant disbelief. So we must remember Let's make a commitment today to remember that true justice will occur at the day of judgment. You know, many times we are disheartened. We say, um, you know, we think, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not punishing these people? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not um, doing, uh, you know, uh, taking them to account? But we must know that there's a special day for that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely, inshallah ta'ala, bring all the people to account um, who you know, who um, we think are getting away with a lot of things. So, no, we make a commitment to know that the Day of Judgment is there to establish justice for each one of us, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy prevail on the mu'mineen, the people uh, who believe, alhamdulillah. We make commitment, um, point number five, when you see the evening fall and the days and nights altering, remember Allah. In, in, in we saw in Surah Yunus, uh, Surah number 10, Ayat number 6, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Certainly, in the variation of night and day, in all that Allah has created in the heavens and the earth, there are signs for people who are conscious of Allah. May Allah make us conscious of Him. May Allah make us remember Him. Uh, in the evening, in the daytime, in the nighttime, in the alteration, in as the, these beautiful mm, changes occur during our course of the day, may Allah make us of those who recall who is the one that is making these changes. Allah is the one who is making these changes and we remember him and we ask for his mercy and we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala please always let us remember you. In the remembrance of Allah truly hearts find peace. Alhamdulillah. And then when we covered Juz 12 by Allah's mercy, we covered Surah Hud by Allah's mercy. As we know that, that Surah Hud is um, Surah number 11. And uh, what is the commitment that we can make? A few commitments we can make uh, w when we looked at this beautiful Surah. One of it is, is that to acquire Jannah, we need Iman, strong faith. 
we need to accumulate good deeds and with all that we need to be humble so iman good deeds and humbleness these are the things that lead us to jannah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us towards this and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to commit to these things that we commit to ourselves that we will work on our iman how does our iman improve iman improves by the connection with the quran majid iman improves with zikr iman improves with with a good company uh, people of you know attending uh, dars attending lectures attending halaqas which um, are of people of scholars who are letting us know about the value of islam uh, doing good deeds helping others um, alhamdulillah uh, helping our society helping our community helping our friends helping our relatives helping the the needy helping the orphans these are the good deeds that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us a humbleness that whatever we do we should not be proud of what we're doing we should be humble to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thank you um, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thank you for guiding us to uh, and giving us these opportunities to increase in our iman, to increase in our good deeds. We couldn't have done it without you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, alhamdulillah, we make a commitment to uh, increase on our iman, uh, to continue to do good deeds, especially in this month of Ramadan, and always be humble to Allah and thanking Him that uh, He has given us the opportunity to do such. Ameen. As we go to commitment number two from Jews number 12, again we are in Surah Hud, Surah number uh, 11, ayat number 45. We see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets us know in this ayat that neither your name, nor your caste, nor your lineage, uh, or nor your righteous parents will ever help us to save us from Allah's punishment. That it is only our righteous deeds which will help us and save us from the punishment of hell. So we cannot rely on uh, anything else but ourselves and um, we can only pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us. We saw in Surah Hud how Nu al-Islam wanted his son to um, come onto the ark, to to get onto the ark, to be saved. And how uh, Hazrat Nu al-Islam's son said, no, I'll save myself. I'll go on the highest mountains. I, I, I'll, I, you know. And so uh, as Hazrat Nu al-Islam was trying his best to get his son on board, on this ark, on this big ship, the sun was defiant. The sun didn't listen. And so such a righteous father, such a righteous parent, such a, a, a noble prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could not give guidance to his son because guidance only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so just because he was the son of Nuh alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayat number 45, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us clearly, And Noah prayed to his Lord, O my Lord, surely my son is of my family, and your promise is true, and you are the best of judges. And in ayat number 46, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in answer, Allah said, O Noah, Noah al-Islam, he was being addressed, he was unrighteous, therefore do not ask me of something of which you have no knowledge. I Admonish you lest you become among the ignorant people. And then Hazrat Nuh salam responded humbly, O oh my Lord, I seek your protection and guidance, lest I, make, lest I may ask you of um, that which I do not have knowledge. For if you do not forgive me and, have, uh, and do not have mercy on me, I will surely be among those who are lost. So, we see here that Hazrat Nuh al-Islam is making a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Hazrat Nuh al-Islam, look, you don't have knowledge of what I have knowledge of, meaning that your son is not of the righteous people. I cannot grant him salvation. And so uh, quickly Hazrat Nuh al-Islam becomes humble and he says, I'm so sorry, you know, that I asked you of something that I had no knowledge of. Truly, these are the true believers who understand the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and are content with the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and to make our own deeds so good 
that we don't depend on anybody else and we realize that we are accountable for each and every deed ourselves. Inshallah ta'ala, we make a commitment to do good deeds all throughout our lives, being on Tawheed, being on monotheism. We go on in Jews number 12, para number 12, we make a third commitment, inshallah, with Allah's mercy, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. As we looked at Surah Yusuf, uh, Surah number 12, ayat number 5, we, were, we have been told that, of course, there are you know, different types of dreams that people can have. Dreams, there are three types. Good dreams are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should narrate them only to a loved one. Only if we, ha if we know that somebody ha is, uh, is our well-wisher, then only we can relate a good dream. Bad dreams are from shaitan. They are to worry us. If we get a bad dream, we should recite istiaza, which is a'udhu billahi min shaitan nirrajim, three times, and spit on the left and turn to the other side and not tell anyone about it. This is while sleeping and if you get up, you have a bad dream, this is what you have to do. And third type is of dream that we know about Third type of uh, dream is from your own mind of the happenings around you. So relay good dreams only to the loved ones, not to those of whom you fear jealousy. Surah Yusuf, uh, Surah number 12, ayah number 5, as we know that Yusuf al-Islam had a dream and he related to his father, Hazrat Yaqub al-Islam, and how Hazrat Yaqub al-Islam asked him not to relate to his other brothers. So, uh, we make a commitment, inshallah, ta'ala, that uh, if we have a good dream, we should only relate to the people who care about us, who are our loved ones. And, uh, and if we have a bad dream, not to say to anyone, but uh, to say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, and um, three times and spit on the left and turn to the other side and go back to sleep if one can. And uh, we need to know that um, some of the dreams, they really are just the happenings around us. Our circumstances just give us different thoughts at night. Inshallah ta'ala. Uh, as we go to commitment number four from Juz number 12, we are still looking at Surah Yusuf. That we make a commitment to fear Allah and always seek his help. To stay steadfast on his deen and Allah will... Inshallah ta'ala, turn, help, turn around and help and protect you from fitna. How Yusuf, Yusuf al-Islam went through many different trials and tribulations in life, when, but he always had fear of Allah and he always used to seek help from Allah and he stayed steadfast on the deen um, of Islam, of, uh, on the deen of monotheism. And so... Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always turned back to him and protected him from any fitna, any fitna, any type of trial, any type of tribulation. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always helped him. From Jews number 12, we look, we're looking at, alhamdulillah, fifth commitment. So we never doubt the wise planning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah Almighty. He knows while we don't and uh, reflect on how Allah saved Yusuf al-Islam from the prison and how the wife of Aziz accepted her sin. This is, uh, it was, um, all these messages were in Surah uh, Yusuf, uh, Surah number 12, ayahs number 45 to 52. So every, you know, in our lives, a lot of things happen in our lives and we wonder why they are happening, you know, and what we need to know is this is Allah's wisdom that his wisdom is far above ours. We cannot understand why a certain thing happens the way it does or a certain thing doesn't happen. Um, so uh, we leave it all to Allah. We pray to Allah. Uh, and we see, we learn from this beautiful surah, Surah Yusuf, Qasutul uh, Bayan. Allah says it's the best of narrations where we see how um, Yusuf al-Islam goes from one stage to another, how his life progresses forward, and then everything falls into place at the end. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah alazim. This is all Allah's wisdom and mercy. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah, we'll look at Juice 13, para number 13, and see if revise a few points that we covered and also make some commitments, inshallah. As we saw in Surah Yusuf, 
uh, surah number 12, ayat number 86 that Yaqub al-Islam, Yusuf al-Islam's father, uh, would, when he would cry, he would say that I only want to complain to my Allah and not to people. You know when the son said to him in ayat number 85, the son said, By Allah, you will never cease to remember Yusuf until you destroy your health and end your life with grief. And what did uh, Yaqub al-Islam turn around and say? What his English translation is? Ayat number 86, Yaqub said, I express my distress and grief only to my Allah, and I know from him that which you do not know. Alhamdulillah. The important point here is that people cannot help if Allah doesn't let them help. So seek help just from him and beg him to answer your dua. Alhamdulillah, we, the first problem that occurs, if ever a problem occurs in our life, the first thing we should do is turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help me. I'm in this distress. I'm in this problem. This is the situation I am in. Please take me out. And then uh, if there are people that need to help you, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let so and so help me. And so it, it is very important to know that people cannot help if Allah doesn't let them. So seek help just from Him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and beg Him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to answer your dua. This is in Surah Yusuf uh, when Hazrat Yaqub al-Islam says that I only complain to my Allah. Ayat number 86. Uh, we go on to commitment number two, which is everything in the universe, even the shadows, prostrate to Allah with humility, but disbelievers refuse to understand and submit. Surah Ghad, the thunder, uh, surah number 13, ayat number 15. So um, all creation in the heavens and the earth bows down before the creator willingly or unwillingly. The faithful prostrate willingly. May Allah make us of the faithful who prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willingly and uh, follow his commands, be submissive to him inshallah ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayat 15 says, they are, so do their shadows bow every morning and every evening before him. Nobody can resist the power of Allah Almighty, the majestic power of Allah. Uh, truly, uh, everything submits to him. May Allah make us of those who submit to him also. Amin. So we make a commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we will submit to him and we will follow his commandments. Amin. Let's go to commitment number three from Juz 13. So as as we saw in, in this beautiful surah, surah Rad, uh, which means thunder, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayat 23 that the English trans translation is, they shall enter the gardens of Eden together with righteous among their forefathers, spouses and descendants, and the angels will come forward to receive them from every side. SubhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you have good deeds, if you are a believer of, of one Lord God, Allah, and you have good deeds, and so then the mercy of Allah comes upon you, and you enter the, the uh, abode of Jannah, the abode of paradise, Garden of Eden, then you will be with the righteous, and the, your forefathers and spouses and descendants who also made it to Jannah. And um, the angels will come forward to receive them from every side. SubhanAllah. May Allah make us of those who enter Jannah. Ameen. So let's make a commitment to make a dua um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring us together, our families together in Jannah. Make dua that you will enter together with your family in Jannah. Ameen. As we look at commitment number four from Juz number 13, we are looking at uh, Surah Rad, uh, the thunder, um, and uh, we're looking at ayat number 28. No, truly no, that from all that is out there, the only thing that will assure your heart is the remembrance of Allah. And as we look at this ayat from the Quran Majid, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides those who believe and find rest and peace in their hearts by contemplating and remembering Allah. Most certainly it is in the remembrance of Allah that hearts find peace and satisfaction. So we pray to Allah we, um, that we make a commitment to ourselves that Allah helps us 
to remember Allah and that way we will have peace in our hearts and in our minds and in our souls in our, in our affairs inshallah ameen we go to commitment number 5 surah ibrahim surah number 14 uh, we're looking at ayat number 41 uh, inshallah sayyidna ibrahim alayhi salam's dua o oh, our lord forgive me my parents and all those who believe in you on the day when reckoning will take place how Hazrat Ibrahim al-Islam remembered his parents and everyone uh, in his dua and how he wanted everyone to be able to um, pass uh, this trials and tribulations of this world and get salvation. So he said, O oh our Lord, forgive me, my parents and all those who believe in you on the day when reckoning will take place. And so we see that this dua is a very, very important dua which we say in our namaz very often rabbana firli wali walidayya wa lil mu'minina yawma yaqumul hisab ameen simply making dua for for your believing parents to be forgiven uh, is something that ibrahim alayhi salam did and we must remember the dua of ibrahim alayhi salam often and remember when you make the dua for others the angels say ameen and to the same for you inshallah so we make a commitment today to this, say this dua often and say it with understanding and hoping that the angels will be saying ameen with us inshallah ameen alhamdulillah rabbil alameen we go on to just 14 by allah's mercy in para number 14 we saw um, two beautiful surahs we went through surah al-hijr and surah nahal the entire Quran Majid is full of gems and full of w wisdom, lots of lessons to be learned. Every ayah it has in-depth meanings also, but we have selected a few, alhamdulillah, so that we can be um, focusing on these as well as any of the other things that you would yourself want to focus on for anything from the Quran naturally each ayah should be focused on and understood with lots of depth inshallah and that is why we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he guides us towards um, continuous learning of the Quran Majid taking courses in different areas taking courses uh, of learning the in-depth understanding of the Quran Majid, beautifying our tilawat, learning more rules about tajweed and so on and continuing our um, learning of the seerah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the ahadith inshallah ta'ala. This uh, continuation of learning Islamic studies, learning about Islam and hoping and praying that we become closer and closer to the understanding of what Allah wants us to know and um, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to always keep us connected and increase us in knowledge. Rabbi Zidni Alma, Alhamdulillah. So as we see Juz number 14, we see um, that um, we want to make a commitment that inshallah we will remember. Point number one, Allah has promised that the Quran will be preserved and guarded without any change till the last hour. We saw that in Surah Hijr, Surah number 15, Ayat number 9. So what can we do? We will be of those who value the glorious Quran by reading, understanding, and memorizing it, inshallah ta'ala. We also want to guard this Quran in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, in our implementation of deeds, inshallah ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful that he has guarded this Quran. Nobody will be able to change it. This challenge has been there for more than 1,400 years. Alhamdulillah, nobody has been able to change a single word of the Quran. It's in the hearts and souls of people. It's written on so many musafs. And of course, nothing can happen to this kalam since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guarding it. Subhanallah. As we go on to uh, point number two, we want to make a commitment that inshallah we will remember that disobedience is made attractive by the Satan, by the Shaitan. What, well, why does he do that? He does that to mislead us from the path which is leading to Jannah. He wants to take us away from Jannah. He wants to take us all to hell like he will be going there. So we, we make a commitment that we will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance very often um, through our own 
um, du'as and through Surah Fatiha which asks for guidance. And guidance can only be given to those who des desire it, who want it. Allah, may Allah make us of those who want the guidance of Sirat al-Mustaqeem, inshaAllah ta'ala. We go to uh, point number three. We want to make a commitment that inshaAllah we will remember to reflect over the blessings from the sea, of the meat, of the ornaments, etc. How Allah moves the boats therein for business and trade, we need to be grateful. So we want to make a commitment to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the sea he has given us, how so much trade occurs in the sea, how we can eat all different kinds of meat, anything from the sea is halal, how we get uh, we get uh, pearls from the sea, we get different ornaments from the sea. Uh, so much of travel is through the sea. We go, we go from in, on a ship from one place to another. This is all Allah's mercy, subhanAllah. All Allah's mercy. So we will try to remember, we will commit to being grateful for not only the land that we live in, truly the land also and also the sea, inshallah. Surah Nahal, Surah number 16, ayat number 11, alhamdulillah. We covered that point there. As we go on to, to point number four in Jews number 14, we saw that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that honey is healing. We saw that in Surah number 16, ayat number 69, that honey is, has healing features. When we are sick, when, when, when we are ill, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also told us to, to use honey. 69 of Surah Nahal. Then eat of all fruits and follow the ways of Allah. There comes from within their bellies a drink of many colors in which there is a healing for mankind. Most certainly there is a sign in this for those who reflect. There is a healing for mankind. SubhanAllah. We will make a commitment inshallah today that we will use honey often. You know many times are, these days especially during the month of Ramadan sometimes our throats become uh, dry so during iftari we can take a spoon of honey during sehri we can take a spoon of honey we can mix honey in some uh, our tea or our milk alhamdulillah it will be a good um, nourishment for the body and a good cure for many of the problems that occur in the body inshallah ta'ala this is the message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how gracious he is how kind he is ameen Alhamdulillah. So, um, as we go to commitment number five from Jews number 14, we see that in we covered this beautiful um, ayat, ayat 125 of Jews, six, of, uh, Jews 14, ayat number 16. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, letting us know here, Alhamdulillah, that invite all mankind to the way of your Allah with wisdom and words of good advice and reason with them in the best possible manner softly and graciously for your Lord knows best as to who strays from his path and who is guided to the right path so we make a commitment and, and take it as our responsibility as a Muslim to call people to Allah give them dawah with wisdom caring advice and polite ways Alhamdulillah how gentle is Allah how kind is Allah he's a rauf Ar Rahim, Ar Rahman, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala guides us towards good, and He wants to us to invite others with wisdom. He's Al Hakim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. May Allah help us to be the kind of people Allah wants us to be, and to invite others to this beautiful Deen of Islam. Amin. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. Then we covered Jews 15. In Jews 15, we we looked at Surah uh, Surah Bani Israel. Surah Bani Israel is, has two names, uh, Surah Isra, uh, it's called in many Quran Majid is named as Surah Isra and many it's called Bani Israel, same Surah, Alhamdulillah. Okay, so this is Surah number 17 by Allah's mercy and as we, co we were covering this beautiful Surah, we can say that we want to make a commitment that inshallah we will remember that doing good to others is actually doing good to oneself. And having bad intention towards others can affect oneself. Um, we looked at this point in um, 
Surah number 17, ayat number 7. Alhamdulillah. Ayat number 7. If you do something good, you will do it for your own soul. And if you do evil, it will provide bad for your own souls. So when the pred prediction of the second warning came to pass, we roused other enemies against you to shatter and disgrace you by entering your temples once again, as had been done before, and destroy whatever fell into their power. So um, we, we saw this ayat, and in the, the, the earlier portion of this ayat, we see, if you do something good, you will do it for your own souls, and if you do evil, it will provide bad for your own souls. So anything good that we do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards us, we have peace in our hearts. There are blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Good always brings good, inshallah ta'ala. This is Allah's mercy and kindness. Anything evil we do, we put ourselves into stress. We put ourselves into anguish. We put others into anguish. Evil only brings evil. May Allah ta'ala help us to walk on the righteous path. Ameen. As we go and see a commitment number two, we want to make a commitment that inshallah we will remember that Quran Majid is Shifa and Rahmat for the believers. Having belief can benefit us both in dunya and in akhira. Surah um, Isra, Surah number 17, Ayat number 82, Alhamdulillah. Thus we reveal the Quran step by step, which is a source of healing and mercy for those who believe in the truth. And as for those who do not and rebel against it, it causes nothing but ruin and disaster. To commitment number three, uh, we will make a commitment, inshallah, to recite Quran Majid at Fajr time. Because as we learned in uh, Surah Isra, Surah Bani Israel, um, ayat number 78, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us there, Establish regular prayers from the time of declining sun till the darkness of night and morning prayer and the recital of the Quran for the, for the recitation of the Quran is specially witnessed at that time. So, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that, it, that when you recite the Quran, it is witnessed by the angels. Alhamdulillah, Allah himself knows everything that is happening. He can see all and hear all. But this is a special time where the angels report to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that so and so is reciting the Quran at Fajr time. So we, we will try to make a commitment that we will do the recitation of the Quran at Fajr time, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, and uh, we will try to be of those that can be witnessed by the angels and good news is for all that this is a very blessed time lots of blessings descend on people who recite quran at this time alhamdulillah we're looking at a commitment four point number four of juz 15 surah isra bani israel we saw um in this surah in ayat number 110 tell your people brackets oh muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam whether you call him Allah or you call him a Rahman, the Beneficent. It is one and the same because all his names are excellent and beautiful. And the ayat goes on to say, do not raise your voice loudly in prayers, nor pray with a very low voice, but follow the middle course. Alhamdulillah, we are the middle nation. We are the balanced nation. And everything here in our, in our deen is very balanced. And here the voice is also being mentioned that the voice should be um, not too loud or not too soft. Alhamdulillah. Also, we are being told here that we should call Allah up with his beautiful names, Allah, or Rahman, or any of the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because we know that to him belong the best of names, the most excellent of names, the most beautiful of names. Let's um, try to memorize, the, especially the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let's call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's make our du'as through these beautiful names, inshallah ta'ala. So we're looking at point number four, call upon Allah or call upon the most merciful. Whichever name you call, to him belong the most beautiful names. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. 
fifth point is from Surah Kahaf, uh, Surah number 18, ayats number 23 and 24. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets us know that never say about any action that you will positively do it the next day. Ayat number 24, without saying if Allah so wills. And whenever you forget anything, remember your Lord at once and say, I hope my Allah will guide me in this matter in a better way than this to a consciousness of what is right. Alhamdulillah, beautiful two ayats here of Surah Kahaf. Always say inshallah when you intend to do something in the future. Alhamdulillah, let's make a commitment that we will try to remember. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us in our, keep this in our memory that we should say inshallah when we talk about the future. Alhamdulillah, these are the few uh, points that uh, we covered. Alhamdulillah, may Allah help us to review them to commit to them and to implement them in our lives. May Allah bless you always. Inshallah, we'll do commitment points of the next uh, juz um, and the coming up juz later on as time goes forward. May Allah bless you always. Ameen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu alayk. May Allah bless you all. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.